Good afternoon, parents and students. My name is Anna Alvarado, Superintendent of Schools at Freeport School District. We are very grateful that you, uh, parents of uh, Freeport High School, found time today to join us either in person or a Zoom meeting. Sorry, I'm just hearing feedback. Can you go back to the original, the cover slide? This afternoon's presentation is an opportunity for us as a district. Sorry, let me put my mask back on. Our original plan is to be able to do a sponsor or facilitate a Zoom meeting throughout the entire district, all the parents. But after further thought, we thought about providing parents the opportunity to have a school-sponsored parent forum so that parents and audience will have the chance to answer questions specific to their child's school and child's grade. On March 17, our district, just like many districts in Illinois, found ourselves turning off the switch. We went from a regular school day to all of a sudden remote learning. And the shelter in place mandate from the governor's office truly allowed us to, it caught us by surprise, but also allowed us to go deeper into our preparation methods and strategies. At that time, we were in a survival mode. Throughout the summer, we found ourselves being able to spend more time collectively as many different teams, over 100 individuals, to plan more thoughtfully, to collaborate across the different stakeholder groups, and able to thoughtfully and comprehensively put a plan together. And thus, being the mode of surviving to being able to thrive more as a district and organization and feeling better prepared to welcome children into school, whether it is remote or in person or blended learning, makes me very proud of the work that many of our staff and different community members and groups have done. Our work is driven by our mission. The board has approved our new mission statement and there are three key words that I want to continue to emphasize. Is our ability to be innovative, making sure that we're creating an inclusive environment for children, and more importantly, to make sure that our plan reflects a student-centered environment. This was no easy feat because we know and realize we were not the only ones impacted by the closure. Our families were also impacted. Our parents became tutors, our parents became daycare, schools and kitchens and dining rooms became daycare places. We cannot do this work alone, but our mission drives us to think about what will educating children look like now and moving forward. We cannot longer limit ourselves to educating children within the four walls of the classroom. And therefore, how do we support our teachers? How do we allocate and use resources in order to be more innovative and provide quality education for our children. The experience of school may change, but we still believe that relationship between teachers, our adults and staff and students play a real key role in our student success. So our agenda for this afternoon, I'm doing the welcome and introduction. I'm not solo in doing this work. I do have uh, Dr. Julia Clote, who is our new executive director for curriculum and instruction. Obviously, I have Dr. Beth Summers, the principal of uh, Freeport High School, and her team. Um, Sarah Haskin, assistant principal. Mr. Brian Lamb is here as well. We also have Tom Elzen, who is director of technology, who has been a key, played a key role in our transition from remote learning to uh, uh, re reopening schools. And I have Paulette uh, Thomas Williams, who is our communication uh, coordinator. 
Uh, we are going to be spending a little time highlighting some of the district-wide school reopening plans and also an overview of the curriculum and uh, framework for uh, different areas of focus. And from there, Dr. Summers will go through very specific a day in a life of a student. What will school look like for parents who chose to, choose to send their children to an in-person instruction? I'm not gonna read all these bullet points, but I want to stress that our guidance, uh, the guidance that we released for school reopening, this became the ISB guidance uh, through the ISDP and um, uh, our partnership with our uh, health department, CDC, all played a role in us establishing our guidelines. So you've heard that there's different models that we're being encouraged or recommended to use. Uh, we also were strongly encouraged that based on the science, children under 13 are being encouraged to be an in-person, even if we have an, a remote option, and also to make sure that uh, how do we make sure that even if students select a remote option, that they could still uh, have the opportunity for high quality education. Okay? We are not, not faulting our parents for selecting to be in a remote option. That's every parent's um, choice and right. But what we want to make sure is we want to be clear that if you are a special education, if you are an English learner, how can we provide for those different needs? So there are three models uh, that we included in our back to school um, guidance document. The in-person learning for our grades, our preschool to sixth grade. And through this, we're able to work with our principals to be able to see uh, how we're able to utilize the classroom um, following some of the, you know, the, the guidelines and social distancing. Uh, also for blended learning, these are for our seventh through, sorry, I'm having trouble with this mask. <laughs> I'm gonna just leave it there. Uh, for, our, for our, thank you, for blended learning for our seventh through 12 graders, uh, and we have uh, two days of school. So we're going with the AB schedule. I know originally there were questions about, we originally thought we wanted to do an AA and then a break and then a BB schedule. But you know, from feedback for many of our parents uh, also saying that three days in a row of no school for students, especially in seven through 12, just feels like a long time of not being in school. But of course, those students also will have a remote option. Um, you also know that we have our remote learning by choice and the deadline for this is August 7th. Um, the link is on the website. We would like the parents just simply fill out an application. We are watching our numbers, okay? And I know that for 7th through 12th grade, um, we are going to look at the number of students who are choosing remote uh, and then we'll see, you know, what our design will be. But for the most part right now, majority of our students who are choosing the remote option are our younger students. Uh, please also be prepared in case there's another mandate for emergency school closure, which is the re return to full remote learning. This time, it's not gonna catch us by surprise. We are prepared to uh, make sure that we um, have a framework and model for what that will look like. And therefore, in the beginning of the school year, teacher training is really a crit critical issue uh, for our work. You may have heard from the stimulus package that school districts receive money through the CARES Act. CARES is the Coronavirus Relief Fund. And that the funding that we received for emergency, we were able to purchase um, additional Chromebooks, especially to be able to equip our students from kindergarten to fourth graders. So if you remember during remote learning, we were not able to do that. We were able to only provide um, Chromebooks for our students starting um, fifth grade. Um, so that will change. We also have what we call the Internet Essentials as our partnership with Comcast. We're in um, families who uh, have no um, internet connection from home are able to complete an um, application. There's a promo code, which is FSD145. And we will be able to um, uh, pay for or fund um, that monthly 
I think it's $9.99, um, so that students from home will be able to have an internet connection. We are also aware that we have families who probably live in a more remote type of area that even an internet connection will not be available. And therefore we are prepared to work with those families as well. So one thing that we learned about uh, throughout this whole pandemic planning is uh, we have to remove the barriers for our families. Our families, there should be no excuse why any of our students will not have access to being educated every day, including if they stay home and choose remote learning. That is a moral imperative that we have, and we're going to make sure that we work with our families so every student, nobody is left behind. So these are the critical components that the working groups that were formed, uh, you know, uh, dug deep into. And this was actually some of those topics that we were able to um, plan for. And as I move on, you're going to see these bullet points, these topics are what's going to be covered in, you know, throughout the presentation. So I'm going to start by asking Dr. Julia Clote, who is our new um, direct executive director for curriculum and instruction. And Dr. Clote will speak to uh, what we're thinking about the design for curriculum and instruction and assessment. Thank you, Dr. Alvarado. I'm Dr. Julia Clote, Executive Director of Curriculum and Instruction here in Freeport. And along with about 100 teachers, staff members, and administrators, I'm working on a plan for the curriculum, instruction, and assessments that we're going to provide to all of your children in the fall. What we have done is we've been thinking quite a bit about the fact that we all know there was a um, there was a gap in the learning and the teaching that happened in the spring. It's just a reality. And so we strive to provide continuity of learning. What that means is that we are going to um, meet the students where they are and meet their needs in order so someday when the day will come where they can walk across that stage at Freeport High School as a graduate. Now, I just want to tell you that I am the parent of two teenagers. So I know what it is like to be thinking about college plans and future plans. And so we are thinking about all of those things that you have in store for your children, whether it's honors classes or AP, and we are providing the best we can, whether it's blended or remote, opportunities that are not going to change the trajectory uh, and so towards success that our students will have. Our students are going to be using instructional technology in the coming year more than they probably ever have before. And we understand that part of that means involving parents and grandparents and families in also engaging in instructional technology. So we decided that Schoolology is going to be a one-stop shop of sorts where teachers will post handouts, lessons, assignments, tests, and communications so that at home, when the students are at home, they will know where they can find the information um, that, their, that their students need. So that's gonna be the primary communication tool. Now, as I said, I've got two teenagers at home and I don't know about you, but when I, they come home from school and I say, what did you do today? Or what did you learn today? More often than not, the answer is nothing. So instead of asking what you learned or what you did, parents in Freeport can take the Chromebook and look at it with their teens and ask the teenagers to show me what your teacher posted on Schoolology. Show me the communication your teacher uh, posted on Schoolology. And it, so it can be a really valuable tool for families to have discussions about the learning that's occurring. So in my house and probably in yours as well, we experienced some loss this spring. There was loss of uh, jobs, there was loss of a missed prom, and we know that, that our students, all of our students, have experienced some sort of loss. So on the forefront of our minds, our number one priority is gonna be social emotional learning. What that means is we want to, our students to know that we 
want to build relationships with them. We want to support them, their social emotional needs and their mental health. And so we're going to be keeping a close eye on our students. We're going to create learning environments that support them. And we're going to do that even if it's virtual. We will work towards establishing positive relationship with our students. We want to make sure that they're supported in this time more than ever. We do have some priority groups that we're paying special attention toward. And I believe Mr. Jack Code is with us remotely and he's going to speak to the special education. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Clote. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jack Code. I'm the Executive Director of Pupil Personnel for Freeport School District. And as Dr. Clote pointed out, we do have some priority groups that we really need to focus in on um, in our planning. And those groups would include students that have a disability of some fashion and students with some English language needs. So we know that we have some students that have some, some needs and we've identified those students. And for the secondary level, um, focusing in on high school in particular, we're looking at those students that need a little more support. Um, maybe they need to be at school four days a week as opposed to just two days a week it's for that in-person instruction. And then we have some that have even more need that need to be at school five days a week to get that in-person instruction and services that they need. Okay, thank you, Ken. So I'm just gonna repeat what was on that slide. Um, our our in-person audience had some difficulty hearing them. So basically what he was saying is that we are recognizing students with IEPs or 504 plans have some additional need. And we also know based on ISBE guidance and guidance of other experts in the field, both in healthcare and education, that in-person learning is beneficial, is the most beneficial learning that we can provide our students. So those students in priority groups, such as IEPs and 504s, will attend more frequently than the students that are in the gen ed environment. So that means that based on their needs, will determine how often the students at Freeport High School will attend school. So some students who just receive their English language arts or math instruction in the general education setting, they would attend two days remote, three, or excuse me, two days in person, three days remote, just like uh, gen ed students do. But those students with IEPs um, for English language arts or math that are in special education um, primary in receive their direct instruction and core instruction in, in special education will attend four days in person. So the level of in person instruction will be adjusted to meet those needs for the students with IEPs and 504s. And it's similar for our priority group of Ang English language learners. In free at Freeport High School, our English language learners will be receiving instruction based on their language proficiency levels. So students that have attested in the early spring before we um, broke for the, uh, the remote learning days, when if they were determined to be at a level of entering in the language proficiency or a beginning language proficiency, those students would attend in person four days a week. And they might be uh, in a bilingual setting or English in the English language learning setting, but they would attend more often because of the, the being in a priority group that has a greater need. I'm going to spend a little bit of talking uh, time talking about enrollment and transportation. So, by following the guidelines that have been established by the state of Illinois. We want to make sure that all of our environments are safe, and that includes our buses. So we will be going through protocols of enhanced disinfecting of the school buses, which includes um, spraying them down with electrostatic sprayers eight to 10 times a day. And then in addition to that, all the buses will be fully cleaned at the end of each route. We're also um, adhering to social distancing guidelines by decreasing the number of students allowed in a bus 
And students are only will only be allowed to share a seat if they are from the same household. Well, as you can imagine, that means that we're going to we're going to have fewer students on a bus. So we have to increase the number of times our buses do their routes. We typically have buses do routes twice a day, and we have increased it to four times a day. The buses will be running routes. That means our bell schedules had to be adjusted. So revised bell schedules allow for a reduced capacity on the buses and will ensure the social distancing on the school buses. Um, and if, if you, uh, a, a bell schedule, it will be available on our website and linked in the um, presentation if you want to see the exact times for um, your school. And now I believe Dr. Summers is going to present the next slides. I'm sorry. <laughs> I couldn't figure out why everybody was looking at me. I was, thought it was Dr. Summers first. So good evening, uh, Mr. Lamb, associate principal here at Freeport High School. I want to talk about the entrance and exit plans um, that we have set up. So right now, currently, we're going to have five entrances for students to come in, and similar to what you guys experienced coming in tonight, um, doing a quick temperature check on those students. Those students that are uh, bus riders will have their temperatures checked prior to getting on the bus. Before, and then those students, when they come in, will be coming in a separate entrance. So we keep our bus riders. Um, in a separate location that have already been temperature checked from the students that are coming in for, from walkers or for pickups. Same with exits, we'll be doing the same thing with, with any exit that's closest to the student's last classroom of the day. Um, they will be allowed to leave that exit to kind of cut down on the amount of students that are walking um, back and forth in the building. Something else that we are rethinking and, and coming up with a plan for is the safety drill component. Um, as many of you guys know, we do several fire drills, you know, intruder drills, uh, inclement weather drills. So all of those will look a little bit differently this year due to the social distancing and the requirements of having uh, 50 students or 50 people or less in a location at a time. Breakfast and lunch. Same as what we're talking about with the, with the uh, safety drill component. Um, that adds a different layer to breakfast and lunch. Normally, you're going to have several, you know, 100 plus students in this location that you're sitting in tonight. Um, we can only have 50 at a time, and that includes, you know, supervisors, cooks, um, everything. So for breakfast, they will be housed here in the cafeteria starting at 7 o'clock in the morning. Uh, for lunches, we're going to run three lunches, which is similar to what's been done before, but we're going to add additional locations. So not only will the students be eating here in the cafeteria, but they will also be eating in the library and three other classrooms that are close by to this location. Uh, we are gonna have two points of, of sale um, for those students to move through the line a little bit quicker, one in here and then one at the library as well. And then the um, hallway and bathroom breaks. So this is, and water fountain. So this is an important, oh, okay. Uh, this one's important for the face masks to be worn. Uh, due to the social distancing and, and the importance of that, so we really need help from the parents and families to ensure that students are wearing that face covering. Uh, but we are going to limit the amount of time students are in the hallways the best we can. So passing time is going to be done in waves where students will be dismissed at probably by floors is our plan at this point. Um, won't most likely be operating on a bell system, but students will be passing in, in kind of in waves. We have also designated specific stairwells as up stairwells and down stairwells um, to kind of help the flow of traffic in those areas. And of course, if the student needs a pass, then the teachers will, will grant passes as needed. Um, but the social distancing in the hallways and bathrooms while giving you water and the drinking fountain, those are all very important things that we're going to have to be mindful of. And that's why that face covering is going to be so important. Um, we are also working on installing more bottle fillers um, rather than using a regular drinking fountain. So students can bring a refillable water bottle from home, fill it up in that bottle station and keep, um, keep germs down that way as well.
Good evening. My name is Sarah Eskin, and I am the assistant principal for curriculum instruction here. So our daily schedule has changed. Um, we started last year at 7.30. That's moved up five minutes, so we'll be starting our day at 7.25 this year, and we will be ending at 1.25. A couple of years ago, we started planning our transition to career academies, and with that, we are going to change to a block schedule this year. We've decided to continue to make that change, but we are still moving to a block schedule, which means that students will have only four periods per day. So on Mondays, students, Mondays and Tuesdays, students will have periods one through four. Our students in the A cohort will go to their classes on Mondays, while the students who are in the B cohort will be at home working through assignments that the teachers have assigned to the B cohort. And then on Tuesdays, they switch. The students who are at home on Monday are now in school with their teachers for periods one through four while the A students are at home. On Thursday and Friday, they follow the same process, but they will be using periods five through eight instead. And on Wednesdays, students will have the opportunity to check in with all of their teachers, periods one through eight. They will follow a Wednesday schedule and each class will meet basically for about 30 minutes and students will be able to check in with their teacher if they need a little bit of extra help somewhere they can ask for it during that time so one of the big questions that has been out there is what happens with grading we are back to normal grading this fall um, students can continue to work to get their grades as high as they want them if they do not do assignments, they will receive consequences for their average meaning is zero, and teachers will be honored to get their work repeated because they want their grades to be as high as possible. One other thing that's different from the spring is that teachers do have to take attendance for students every day with every class. So when they're in person, that's easy. They're in the classroom, they're much present. But when students are remote, then we have to be a little more creative with our attendance. And so teachers have, will have many options to count those students present in their classes on those remote days. Um, they, if students just complete assignments, that could be one way to count those attendance. Uh, teachers might start a Zoom meeting or they might have students go on Google form. And so there's many different options that teachers have to track attendance with. Some of the meetings might be in person or using a Zoom meeting. Um, there might also be times where your student doesn't log on until six o'clock that night and they can still have attendance counted because they completed their assignment. And with at the high school level, there's a variety of courses. A lot of those courses are the being hands on courses. And this is going to be a bigger challenge with the remote learning. If any of your students who are part of Career Tech or they have a class at Highland, you will be receiving more information from those entities about what those courses will look like. They will probably be a blend of in-person and remote learning. Our driver's education students have to complete 30 hours of, in, of classroom learning. They can do that in person and they can also do that online. They also have to complete those six hours of driving instruction and that has to be with an instructor. So if your student is in driver's education, and you choose remote learning by choice, your student does still have to come to campus once a week for driving instruction. That would probably be after school or possibly on Wednesdays. If this is not something that you want to do, if you've chosen that remote learning, um, then we can schedule your student for driver's in the, in the future, next year or something. Um, we have other hands-on electives, such as our auto mechanics classes, and we have some virtual curriculum that the teachers will be able to use with those students when they're not in person. Our music classes are going to be a challenge as well, and the teachers are going to take them outside as often as possible. Um, if the weather does not allow that, then they'll probably be working more in small groups. Um, we realize that choir and bands are going to be a little bit more challenging. Um, orchestra, they can keep their masks on because they don't need their mouths to play their instruments. Um, but the music teachers have been working all summer about, uh, with some plans and ideas about what they can do. Um, same with our art classes. Uh, there will be supplies that are separated by students and the teachers have been working with some other alternatives that they can provide to students. 
And with PE, there will be sanitation done between every group so that the, the equipment is sanitized each time. And they're going to be taking the students outside as much as possible. And probably the biggest change is that students will not be required to dress for PE. Most of them will probably love that. There are certainly some perks for teenagers in the new plans. Um, and so one of them that they're probably going to struggle with, because I think we all do, is wearing a face mask all day. So uh, many parents have been working with their students already to start wearing it a little bit longer each day because it's difficult and it's something you have to get used to. Um, social distancing in the classrooms. Here at the high school, all the desks are staying in the classrooms assigned seats, and then students will sit in alternating desks each period so that the teachers can spray them and disinfect them and let it dry before the next class comes in to sit in that desk. Um, increased cleaning and disinfecting, drinking fountains and nutrition and dining services, we've hit on those a little bit. So let's go ahead to the next slide and we'll get into those a little bit more. If you have a student who expresses in the morning that they're not feeling well, this is a different time we're living in. And so we'd encourage you to keep your student at home and call us and let us know that we're keeping them home out of caution. Um, especially in our county, we've heard from the Stevenson County Health Department that it's the loss of taste or smell or those stomach issues or diarrhea that are some of the key symptoms to be looking for. So those might happen prior to maybe a fever or some other symptoms. Uh, we also know that we have to keep our students fever free and separated for 10 days if they do have symptoms. Now there may be a case where you're going to involve your physician and they're going to rule out COVID during that time so that your student can return to school. Can we go to the next one? In the nurse's office, if we have a symptomatic student, this is kind of normal for us, right? That happens at school. Kids come down and they don't feel well. But this year, if you have a COVID symptom, which is a lot like other symptoms, we're going to have to keep you separated and determine what our next course of action is. And that means students that come down to the nurse's office to get their meds or a Band-Aid are going to have to be seen separately so that we don't have that space being contaminated with two different groups. We'll call parents. Parents will be asked to come pick up their students if they're not feeling well. And then if the health department determines that we need to do something with a COVID positive case, they will take over. They will the one, be the ones that will do the contact tracing and will work with the school district to determine which families need to be contacted. Things flip a little bit from cleaning and disinfecting. So in a typical day, we really focus on cleaning. We mop the floors, we make sure all the garbage gets picked up, and we focus on that and then we disinfect later in the day but with students and staff here using multiple spaces and touching things we kind of have to flip that and disinfect all day and clean later so this schedule is just a sample of how we're going to navigate that with our custodians this year the school board has provided flexibility for all of our families and that flexibility means that this is the normal school attire for a non-uniform day. And so this year we're going to function on a non-uniform process to allow families the flexibility to send their students either in the uniform or in something else that makes sense for them. Okay, still has to meet these typical rules that you would expect. Other important information to know really specific to the high school. So we have new freshmen and freshmen normally get to come over and tour the school in the spring and then we have a little informational meeting and none of those things happen like normal so on the 18th of august and there's a mailing going out next week with more information but on the 18th our freshmen will pick up their chromebooks and they'll have an opportunity to walk the building and find their classes and we're going to do that so that they have that opportunity to feel more comfortable as they get started New this year, we're also offering a contact-free payment option, which will allow parents from that mailing 
to return items to the school. So the box will actually be located just outside of this parking lot here by the door. There's a camera right over it. And you're going to receive in that mailing next week your bill. So if you would like to just drop it off as um, all, any of the forms or a check, we'll get that out of the box. There's also going to be really good instructions for how to pay everything online, how to scan your forms back. So all of those things would work out this year. Um, and then a reminder that our school starts on August 27th. Also included in that mailing will probably be magnets if they arrive on time, have the whole schedule on it for the year. So I saw some of you taking pictures as we went through all these slides. Please know we're going to post this as well as the Zoom meeting has been recorded throughout the, the entire session here. So you can go back and listen to it again and kind of listen to that one specific spot that is, interests you the most. Um, I know we've received some questions and we'd, we'd like to receive more questions. Um, we have several people here in the audience one of the items that I can address right now is that students at the middle school and high school level have all been designated either in the A cohort or the B cohort. And after people have the opportunity to choose the remote learning by the 7th, the following week, you will receive your A or B cohort information. Okay, I think at this time, we would like to open it up for some questions from those of you here in the audience. And um, I'm sure Paulette has some from some people on Zoom as well. All right. Uh, I actually have a number of questions. Uh, the first question is, should I be considered for campus lunch for some of the students? Uh, as school be shut down if there is a confirmed case of COVID. Those are the three, huh? Okay. So I'll answer the first one here. As far as open campus, that is not our plan right now. We have some outdoor spaces, a lot of wonderful trees around here, and we would like to allow students an opportunity to go outside not only just to enjoy the nice weather if it's a nice day, but to take their mask off for a little bit outside. Um, the other part is that splitting up in this room, we can still only accommodate 50. And so there's a lot of space in between us when we're eating. And the same thing will happen in the other spaces. Um, the next question that you had had to do with transportation, right? No, it was office hours. Yeah, office hours for um, staff. On Wednesdays, I think Ms. Haskin talked about a half hour schedule all day. With our final dismissal time at 125, we expect that that's when our teachers are going to touch base with all of those remote learning students. But I should also make another thing clear. If I'm an in-person student that day and I'm in class, but you're at home, Pastor, you might be joining on a Zoom call during the lesson. So you might feel like you're in person and getting some of that contact with the teacher. And if not, then that's when you would contact them later. So you think you actually have the, the in-class experience through virtual learning without it, provided that they really need to do it. Right, yes. Provided they wake up, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and what was the third question? Third question. Will the school be shut down? Oh, yes. Yep. So the health department is very conservative. And I think Dr. Alvarado would agree. In every conversation we've had with them, they have been very clear that they take contact tracing seriously and that they're not going to let something get out of control. They will, they will be giving us the advice that we need to receive, and they'll be precautionary in their advice. So should, should they go to the screen, they have Hours, 
Yep. So we have a group working on that, and we are. Oh, sure. So the, the question there is the students, if we were to have to all go home, what kind of schedule would we have? Um, and we do have a group working on that. The group is truly focused on the fact that we need to have a schedule because we need to have that normalcy. And just posting something on Monday and expecting teenagers to stay engaged all week, we all know that that won't, right? So there is a group working on a schedule. But to be very honest, we are talking about when would we engage with students? Would it start at 9 or 10 o'clock? Or would we start at 725 like normal? And so that's really kind of what we're, we're weighing the, the pros and cons. Can we take a virtual? Yes, we can take a virtual question. We'll get to you. Will there be any sports at all is the question. Okay, will there be any sports at all? Well, we sure hope so. Um, many of you know that IHSA released some additional guidance yesterday, and for lack of a better way of saying it, they shifted all of the seasons until later in the year. Um, right now, for example, football is slated to start practicing in February with an opening day of March 1 in a seven-week season. So these, these things change. We've all learned that as time has gone on, and we hope that we will be able to have something available for them. Can I take her question here and then I'll come to you? So you bring up a good point with those hands-on classes. Auto would be another example. Okay, repeated the question here. So the question is, what about really hands-on or course-specific classes like CAD or Auto or Woods? How are you going to adapt the curriculum if we're all at home? And what are we going to be able to use? And she specifically referenced a computer issue with CAD that happened last spring. So our solution is to be ready to pivot. We've purchased some additional resources, and we know that things will not be exactly the same, but we're going to make sure that the skills that we want students to have out of that class are able to be taught in another manner, even if we're not hands-on, we're using exactly the same tools we plan to use if we were in person. Okay. Oh. Yeah, so this was a, a specific question about college now and how that partnership is going to work with Highland Community College. Um, as you know, Highland has committed to giving a lot of flexibility and choice to their students, just like Freeport School District has. And so there are courses that are both online and in person that allow them to have that flexibility to still continue with their dual credit or their other studies uh, associated with Highland Community College or the Career Tech program. So there's, there's a plan to continue to do that. Can I answer your question? Yeah, I want to reflect back on sports. How are they going to do that with residents? Yeah, so you hit on, you hit on what um, are concerns for everybody. So the question is, how are they going to handle high contact sports like wrestling? And I don't think anybody has a great answer to that, but uh, the sports have been categorized in three different groups, low risk all the way to high risk. And as you can imagine, wrestling, football fall into that high risk category, which makes them sports that we have to be more cautious about how we handle our athletes and how we handle that competition piece. Yeah, yeah, and, and those are some of the seasons that have been pushed back, and I think that's really the reason they've been pushed back, is that they're hoping there's better guidance and maybe some medical changes that'll help us have those competitions. Can we take a few of the virtual questions? Yep. How will NJROTC be affected with the new schedule? Will it be possible if the remote learning option is chosen? Okay, so the question is, can I still be an NJROTC if I'm in remote learning? 
And the answer to that is the same as it is with many of our other classes. For example, our music classes, if you pick remote learning, you can still be in that course, but just understand your experience is going to be different. You're not going to be here in school and you may be participating in a different way with that elective group. So for example, if you had a leadership role on the NJROTC team of leaders, you, you might not be able to be in that leadership role in the same capacity as if you were here in person. My student is in band. Will this still count as PE, even if there is no marching band because there are no sports? Yes. Um, so all of our PE waivers, and I'm really glad Ms. Haskin and I just had this conversation this morning, um, all of our PE waivers are going to be honored, whether it's for a marching band or for a fall sport that's not going to happen in the fall. We are not going to penalize students for the fact that things have shifted around. So our waivers will be honored. One more? What do you have to do to self-certify that you are symptom-free? Okay, good question. So to self-certify that you are symptom-free, you are simply sending your student to school. And this is truly where the partnership between school and family is so critical because we're trusting that every morning you are taking that temperature check and asking about symptoms at home before you even send them to school. And then when we get here or when they get here, we're going to do the same thing at the door. We're gonna say, hey, how are you feeling today? Pretty good, great. Your temperature's great, all right, we're good to go. And so that's truly it. All that you're doing is engaging and partnering with the school. Can I take a question from over here? It is a choice. So the high school students are in those AB cohorts. So if they choose in person, they're still only here two days a week. How are we are going after the seventh when everyone has an opportunity to select a or if they want to be remote or not, then we will release who's in which group. So, so you are correct that we will have roughly, and the question here was, what are you going to do about all of the different contacts that students come into contact with, and how are you going to sanitize between the A and the B cohort? Um, we will have roughly 600 students here on campus at a time. That's half of our population, which does free up a lot of space in the hall, but that doesn't mean that we're we're not going to be in contact with each other because there are a number of students here. As far as the sanitizing goes, that's where our custodians are going to utilize the Clorox 360 machines and the Virex on a frequent basis to kill all of the germs each day. And that's also where all of our staff are on board. So I described earlier the teacher seating chart where they would seat every other row and the teachers are gonna help sanitize those desks in between. Yeah, continue to practice good hygiene, continue to wear their masks, continue to do all of the things right. And you know, that's always something that we teach at school. So if this was a normal year and we came back to school, we would teach how to handle yourself in the hall, how to handle yourself at lunch. Now we add on how to make sure that you're washing your hands for 20 seconds, how to make sure you're maintaining six feet of distance. So it's constant teaching and reminders probably very similar to what you're doing at home with your students already, you're constantly reminding. And then if we do have a discipline situation where there's refusal, then unfortunately they won't be able to be here.
Sure. So the question here is all about Zoom and how are teachers going to use Zoom and is it going to be recorded and how is my student going to access that? And um, if they choose full remote, what role does Zoom play? So as you can imagine, teachers in different courses are going to have different needs for Zooming all of the time. Um, so I don't expect that all of our teachers will always have Zoom on, but I do expect that when there is an opportunity to engage in that discussion, or especially you know, with some of our classes where there's frequent demonstrations, like a math course, that they may be Zooming more often so that students from home can catch up to that information. If a student chooses full remote, that means they're going to be remote every day of the week. So whether they're A or B, they're going to have to be engaged every day. Our teachers will likely plan in-person discussion and activities that they're going to want to join on one of those two days because they're going to be presenting to the in-person students likely two days in a row the same information and remote information will be given to the other students to work on separately or to join the discussion does that make sense they will they will get in-person instruction two days, just like everybody else, but they will have to join remotely. But they will still be a remote learner all five days. Right, so, so let me give you an example. If I'm teaching Romeo and Juliet, I have an in-person lesson for Romeo and Juliet that I'm going to present to the in-person students. Meanwhile, the remote students might be reading and dissecting a particular piece of Romeo and Juliet. The next day the other group of students come, I present the same in-person lesson while the other group works on the out-of-school piece. Does that make sense? Sure. She will, she will have to join one of the groups, either A or B. Yeah. yeah. So the first okay. question, will there be sanitizing products available to use besides hand sanitizer, such as disinfecting wipes? Should students need to wipe anything down? Um, the school will not be supplying disinfecting wipes, um, but we do have towels that they can use with our hand sanitizer, or they're welcome to bring something from home. How will you handle the kids who have seasonal allergies because the symptoms could be similar to COVID? Okay, the question here is about allergies and the symptoms being similar. And we will have to treat them as a symptomatic student until a doctor tells us otherwise. And that's where it's gonna be important for a doctor to be involved. If a family has multiple children in seven through 12th grade, will all have the same AB schedule? That's a good question. So. How are the A and B scheduled cohorts um, going to happen? And I can answer that they are by family. So that if your household has a high schooler and a middle schooler, they will both attend on A day, for example. Do you have another one? How are you going to monitor the kids on the virtual school days? How will you know they get online? Oh, yeah, this is where adults get to be sneaky. So the question is, how are we going to monitor the students when they're virtual? Um, I think Ms. Haskin addressed this a little bit in her slide, but there are multiple ways, either by turning in homework or by monitoring their activity. And there's actually a button in Schoology that teachers can push called analytics that tells us when they were there and what they did. So even if they just look at the assignment but don't do it, we're going to know that they interacted with it. Yeah, all the way back. Okay, so two questions there. The first one was, 
will my daughter on a B day, if she's an A student, need to get in touch with her teacher? And I wouldn't say she would have to get in touch, but she's going to have to do her assignments and reach out if she has any questions, because that's what the teacher will assign. The second part of that was, if I send my child to school, but then later decide that I want remote, is that gonna be an option? And the answer to that is, we want you to choose for the information that you have now for your family, because we need to make plans as a district. If there is a future situation that comes up, and I think this was addressed in Dr. Alvarado's letter, we're going to be asking you for more information about that because it's no longer just a choice. We're gonna to wanna to have some details about why there needs to be a change. If she chooses remote, she will do her music from home. The question was if she would need to come for band or not. Pastor? So, if I'm understanding it correctly, there's, I thought the letter was about to talk about this or not, specific as it related to if you're on remote learning, they want you to teach that for the semester versus if you're in school going to teach. Yes. Yes, that, that was her question. If you're in person, can you switch to remote at a later time? And we would discourage that because we really have to plan. And so that's why we're holding these sessions and we would like everyone to make the best decision they can. But I'll give you an example, and I think this is, you want to address it? Yes. Yeah, and, and she wanted to re reiterate that we have almost two weeks for parents to make those decisions. And so we want you to talk to us about what your concerns are. Yep. So the question is, how can teachers do both? Be a good in-person instructor and be monitoring the Zoom chat. And I think at the high school level, we're going to rely, probably at the middle school level too, rely a lot on our students for that. They, they're pretty technically adept. They can be tuned in in class as well to that Zoom. And one of our students could assist the teacher in saying, hey, uh, Dr. Summers has a question. Do you have one? So the same thing would be true. The question is, what if I, what if I choose remote, um, can I put them back in? And this is a semester decision. If you choose remote, you're staying out for the semester. I would fully expect that many of our classes will go outside whenever they can. Um, one of our elementary principals joked that she might have to assign tree time because that would be a nice way to be outside and maybe do a lesson under the tree for a little while. So I would fully expect that as many of our teachers as possible will take advantage of that. But most especially our music teachers and our PE teachers will be outside as much as they can. So the question is, will they be able to take their mask off at any time? So they'll have to socially distance at lunch in order to take off their mask. And then that outside time would be another opportunity to take off their mask if they can be socially distant. You talked earlier about the things go outside at lunch. Is that not 
her question is, can they really go outside at lunch? And on a normal day and a normal year, no. We all stay in this cafeteria. Uh, but this year, we'd like to give them the opportunity to take their lunch outside and, like I said, sit under that tree. Nope, no, they can get their lunch and go outside and they just need to be back in time for the next class. So um, there, is, there is a little bit of flexibility. We're gonna have to put some ownership in our students to do what they need to do.